Okay, welcome everyone. Um, it is a kind of yucky day, so we're going to go someplace pleasant online. Um, John Schwachman is a really interesting artist. I've 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 seen um, you know a bunch of his pieces in person, but I've never really gotten a satisfactory feel for the guy. Um, you know, it, it, his work is in um, a number of collections. They they have they have several pieces in the Metropolitan, and in I've seen his work in other collections. Um, this upcoming show at the Greenwich Historical Society is going to be focused on the work that he did uh, on his on his farm and property in Greenwich. Um, so basically, uh, Bachman was a Cincinnati-born uh, artist. He um, reached his maturity living in, in Greenwich from 1890 to 1899. Um, he painted his home, his property. He uh, earned a reputation as one of the most original leading, they're calling it American Impressionist, but um, but we'll, we'll have more of a conversation about that throughout. Um, this exhibition celebrates the launch of the um, J.H. Twachman catalog resume, which is online, and you can access it through the Greenwich Historical Society, or you just put in um, J.H. Twachman catalog resume, and you, you can get there. They have really wonderful high-resolution images on that site, um, and, and it, when you pull up the images, uh, this, the, um, Woman who organized and researched all of this is Lisa Peters, uh, and she's um, been working on this for, I believe, over 20 years. Um, so this is a real um, magnificent piece of work that she's got here. Um, okay, so born to working class parents, uh, both German immigrants, they they uh, lived in a rather grungy Cincinnati um, at that time in the you know 1850s 1860s. It was the um, pig butchering capital of of America. Okay, that's what it's, that was kind of its claim to fame. Um, it was it was as you will see actually. I'll, pop up the next image. Uh, the, the top left is, is um, the Miami Canal, which is, you know, basically, you know, you can see the factories, you can see the color of the, of the snow um, and get, get some idea of how gray the, the atmosphere was. Um, and below is another winter landscape. Um, and you, you see the color of the sky. I mean, basically, you know, we're talking about an industrial town. Um, so um, he got to start painting um, window shades uh, in, in a factory in Cincinnati. His, uh, his father was a trained carpenter um but at the time he had a job in a in a in a um a window shade factory or something something along those lines and and Twachman started out painting designs on those window shades he took classes with um uh, a fellow by the name of Frank Devenack and there's a there's a piece on the lower left hand corner of this fellow's work um in in that class he showed a lot of talent and and Devernick really befriended him um he actually i believe and i'm not 100 percent certain about that but but i believe he met his future wife in in some of the classes that he was taking um 
her father was a very successful doctor uh, who ran a big clinic in Cincinnati. So she was from a very different kind of class and um, all that. But uh, they, they had an artistic interest in common. So um, I, I don't have the dates on when, um, when they married, but they ended up marrying. They had seven children together, five of whom grew to adulthood and two of their sons ended up becoming uh, architects which is kind of interesting um anyway back to back to Devernick and and Twachman's relationship they they actually were were ended up um traveling together to Munich which was a a place that in the 1870s was really um, vying with Paris as a, a major center for, um, for art. And given the fact that, that both Devernick and Twachman were fluent in German and, and all that, and coming from their, that background, um, studying in Munich seemed to make some kind of sense. Um, so, um, one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is um, when they were in Munich, they were they were really working with the kind of Dutch masters as their as their um, uh, the direction that they were going. They the technical aspects the um, how how they how the paint application worked and all that stuff they learned a lot from them but at the same time there was a uh, movement in in France called tonalism and well at least that's the name that 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 it ended up with um, it, it was really uh, the French Barbizon style and and um, Corot which is in the upper left, is, is really um, one of the fathers of that type of painting. It was really the first group of painters who went out and painted plein air because that the, during the mid 1800s, the um, paint tube was invented. And so this was, this was something that they went out and did. Um, <clears throat> So tonalism was an artistic style that emerged in the 1880s when American artists began to paint landscape forms with overall tone, colors, and atmosphere and mist. Um, kind of uh, between 1850 and 1915, the dark neutral hues such as gray, brown, and blue often dominated the compositions. Um, Artists associated in the artists associated with the style during during the late 1890s, the American art critics began to use the term tonal as a description of these works. So um, on the lower right is a painting sunny autumn day by George Innes and you can see, you know, this is really typical tonal work. Um, now. The other influence on, on Twachman um, at that time were Turner's um, uh, watercolors and Turner's paintings. Those in turn influenced uh, McNe um, James, Mc James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Okay, Whistler's landscapes were a direct influence on, on the development in uh, Twachman's work. Um, okay, and there's a great quote here, paint should not be applied thick. Whistler uh, famously stated, it should be like breath on the surface of a pane of glass. Through an innovative man manner of handling paint, a group of American artists around 1900 created deceptively simple canvases that convey images of shimmering transients. 
visions suggesting rather than delineating. Okay. Um, in the in the eighteen eighties, well, actually, um, we'll go back. Uh, this is this is Venice, um, and and actually, um, Twachman, Devernack, and uh, William Merritt Chase went to Venice together and painted um, those impressions, and and actually, you can see that that um, Twachman's work is less detailed it's really gestural there's there's large areas of of open space in them um the paint application is still really juicy but but there's a freshness to it and a direct observation of the the activity that's in front of him um Twachman remained friends with, with a number of these artists, Chase um, and, and several others that are identified with the Impressionist movement. Okay. He, he came back to the United States for a brief period of time. Um, by this time he was married. Um, they, they moved back to Paris in uh, 1883, I believe it was. And at that point, um, the, the Japanese woodblock print was all in vogue. The, the, uh, the um, Impressionists were very influenced by these big flat planes of color that they were seeing in the in the Japanese prints, and you can see this Monet at the bottom, and and how broad the areas are. Um, Kwakman would have seen these Japanese prints, and 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 there's more evidence of him having long discussions about the qualities of those prints and what what they're about, and the placement and the asymmetry, many different aspects of it. And I'll move on to this one, which is uh, a Twachman and done in 1884. Very thin paint, not the, the broken brushwork of the Impressionists at, at this stage of the game. It was very thin paint in veils and, and um, applied to the surface. Let's see, I've got some things that I wrote up about this. Oh yeah, here we go. Here we go. Um, yeah, the, the Japanese prints, um, Twachman derived the idea um, that broke the conventional composition, um, designing out of flat shapes and uh, the pictorial plane, the flat pictorial plane. Um, here's another one. This piece is in the Metropolitan Museum. I've seen it many times and admired it. It's a very beautiful, beautiful piece. It's big. This is 60 by 78 inches. Um, so using subtle grays and earth tones, greens and blues, adjacent colors on the color wheel, uh, that means, you know, basically they have a relationship to one another and they harmonize. Um, it, it's basically gave us this harmonic relationship for us to contemplate the, the landscape. Um, Clockman really maintained a dedication to direct experience while creating these distilled images. Um, the early modernists much admired his vision and, and in actuality, um, people like Milton Avery and, and Marston Hartley would have known his work and, and admired it for its, you know, let's see, what can I say? There's, there's a tenderness and delicacy in the paint handling, but there's also this bold, big flat shape that he's that he's dealing with 
this kind of vaporous atmosphere that he creates. Um, it's an invitation to enter into a really serene space. Um, this figures in, into his work a good deal. Um, so, okay, gonna move along here. Okay, uh, two of his other close friends, uh, J. Alden Weir and uh, Childe Hassim, um, they were very close friends. Hassim um, uh, really spent time with um, Twachman in their Greenwich home. Um, and and they, they all went out and painted together at times. Um, Weir was actually the one who introduced him to Greenwich. Speaking of Greenwich, I'm gonna move on to here. The old Holly House. Now, this is a late painting for 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 this. It's kind of out of order a little bit. Um, it's 1901. Um, in actuality, uh, Twachman moved to Greenwich in 1899, I believe. But but he was going out to the Holly House before that. They actually he actually um, let's see. Let me step back a, a, a bit. He actually, in the early 1880s, uh, secured a position at the Art Students League to teach a foundation class uh, in drawing, and and so he and he maintained that position throughout throughout his um, his life. Actually, that is really where he made most of his living. He did sell his paintings, but he was not that successful. And in certain ways, that lack of commercial success made for um, his ability to maintain his independence and, and, and forge his own path. Uh, I'm gonna check something. Uh, Okay, all right. So um, let's see. So the Holly House is still there. It's part of the, um, um, you know, the uh, Greenwich Historical Society, and it's part of the campus where the show is going to be taking place. So I am going to go here, and there is the image of the Bush Holly House in present day times. Um, so you can see it's the forms are still pretty much the same. Um, okay. And uh, so one of the things that he did was he started doing workshops out there during the summers with his students from the Art Students League. So they would come out and they would paint plein air and, and work together. Um, okay, what happened when um, Twachman was introduced to Greenwich by Weir, he came out, stayed at the, uh, the bush at the, excuse me, at the time it was just called the Holly House. It was a, it was a tavern and, and inn. Um, and he um, he would go out and paint in the in the surroundings, and he he went out looking for property, and a couple of miles away he found this wonderful stream that he just fell in love with, and he was walking around the property with his son, his then seven year old son, and just fell madly in love with this property, and he just decided that this was something that he he had to have. Um, and uh, even though this 17 acre farm had nothing but a very rudimentary, not too attractive rundown house on it, he was just so thrilled with the property that he had to buy it. <laughs> and, and so that is how they ended up moving from New York City out into Greenwich, Connecticut. Now, 
The other thing I want to say at this point is Greenwich, Connecticut was not what it is now. It was not the golden land. At the time, it was really farmland and, and fishing shanties. Um, it had a very high, actually rather high black population. The, his next door neighbor next to this farm was a black stonemason. Um, and, and many of the, um, the fishermen in the town were were black, um, so there was actually a um, a very active underground railroad in that area earlier in in the century. So there was a, there was quite a settlement in in Greenwich. Um, so it wasn't fancy digs actually um, back at that time. Um, one of the other things that happened was the, the they developed a, a group of painters, um, uh, the Coscob Impressionists were kind of gathered around um, and Twachman was really a central figure in that group. But there's Hasim, there's, there's Ware, um, uh, Robinson, who was another fairly well-known American Impressionist came out and, and worked there. Um, so let's see. Okay. And, you know, this is, this is again on the property. This is, um, uh, you can actually see that there's, hmm, let's see if I can do this. I'm going to zoom in a little bit right in here. Can you make out sort of a structure in there? There's sort of a roof and, and a line there. This is, this is sort of a structure that's in, in those hemlock hills. Um, but you can see on the left this, uh, I mean, on the right, this pastel that's sort of very, very faint and very abstract. Um, one of the things, I'm, I found this wonderful article that was written about about um, Twachman, and and I want to I want to really you know I'm, I'm going to read you some excerpts from this. It was written by a, a fellow by the name of Paul Richard, who um, I believe this was this was writing for the New York Post from an exhibit that took place in. Um, I believe it was 99, um, but I'm, I'm not 100% certain about when, when, it, when it was written. Um, the American Impressionist lived his last two years in turmoil. A friend observed something gnawing at his soul. Abandoned by his wife, tossed with wild mood swings, wobbly from drink. You'd never guess, you'd never guess this from his art. Um, they place you in the woods alone, soft sounds you hear there, a bird's dampened call in a sea fog the crackle of withered leaves, the rustle of water trickling under ice are just, just this side of silence. There among the hemlocks beside the country stream, drifting out of focus, floating into reverie, blending with the all, no wonder he loves snow. Staying at the Holly House in Coscob, he sauntered towards a window, stood in silence for a few moments. Turning, he said, ah, but nature is fine this morning, and went out of the room. The maid brought his breakfast. 
it sat there and grew cold. Somebody went out to find Mr. Twachman. They found him standing outside in the snow, painting like mad, utterly forgetful of his breakfast. He had ordered and never eaten. Something in his spirit suggests the mysteries of Albert Pink and Ryder. But Ryder painted in darkness while Twachman painted light. Ryder conjured dreams while Twachman on his Greenwich farm adhered to the landscape there, painted what he saw. Whistler's names mentioned too, sometimes, with good reason, though the ruralness of, of Twachman's work and the roughness of his brushwork contradicts the daintiness and elegance of the art for art's sake dandy that was Whistler. Monet is evoked as well, but the Frenchman painted, uh, the Frenchman painted local scenes at different times of year in different lights and weathers, but Twachman never cared for Monet's broken color and rarely um, shared his preference for the brightness of the sun. No other artist of the period painted quite like Twachman. This guy had a lot to say. <laughs> um, so Twachman actually, along with seeing the, 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 the Japanese prints, also studied um, Japanese philosophy and actually Zen Buddhism was something which he, which, which he explored. Now I'm gonna move on. Okay, this is the house which Twachman bought. This is present day shots in Greenwich, Connecticut of what the house developed into. Twachman uh, knew quite well what was going on at Givernay because uh, his friend, um, um, actually, let's see if I can find it. Um, no, not here. Okay. Um, he he was aware of what was going on with the with the the changes in the landscape at Chivernay. Um, now, Monet was actually creating his subject matter out of out of the the landscape, and Twachman did his own version of that. He he actually. Um, uh, added on to the building, added extra dormers, and you can see it develop in, in the paintings of his house and the property. And we'll go on to look at some of those. So here are a couple of pastels. They're modest in scale, but you can see how humble the house was. You know, this one over here on the, on the left, you can see it's just a single structure. Then you can start to see on the right, how there's additions coming on to the side of, of the house and it's getting larger and expanding out. All the time, Twachman is painting this thing. Now, he's got a large family. He's got, you know, five, at least five living children, if not seven living children in this, in this house, with, which was a rather modest house to begin with. So he needed to expand it. Um, and here's another shot. Now it's got two dormers on the side of it. Um, um, and this is, you know, late summer, again, very, very much seasonally conscious that these, these pieces, and you can see the chalkiness, the kind of, um, emulation of pastel into oil paint that, that Twachman was, was playing with. He, he actually developed this technique of, of, this very kind of crusty, um, uh, chalky quality out of the oil paints. Uh, 
again, another shot, another view. One of the other things I want to point out is the square format in a lot of these pieces um, actually is part of the, the, the harmonics of it. If you, you look for it, there are actually, you know, divide, dividing lines in central image, and then, and then um, it's, it's kind of quartered in, in certain ways. Now, this one's not exactly a square, but many of his pieces are squares. Okay, again, here we go, 30 by 30. And, and there's, a, there's a sense of, if you look at that doorway, look at where that lands. It lands just about at the center of, of, the, of the, the image. Um, okay, he loved snow. Spent a lot of time painting in the snow. The subtle use of warms and cools, you see that just little bit of hint of green in, in the building itself, in, those, in the door and in the window. And the, the kind of um, slightly reddish tint in the, in the white haze of the snow. Okay, another view of the house. Very atmospheric. Um, again, 30 by 30, the square. There's a, there's a sense of, of calm. Um, it really... Um, is is part of the 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 stability of the canvases that that they that they have this square format and although the brushwork is very rough and 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 um and moves um there's still a stability from from these canvases This is probably one of the most light-filled pieces that that he did. Um, it's it's again the house, um, thicker paint, um, let's see. Ah, sorry. Shuffling through the, some pages here, um, yeah. So you can see, you know, the 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 double porch and and the 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 end of the building added on. There's there's all kinds of stuff that 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 he over over time added to the building. So they've been in there by this time for about three years, and. Um, Although, although the um, Lisa Peters has done a really great job at identifying timing on these things, she did a lot of that through looking at the changes that took place in the house and when those changes uh, took place because he didn't he didn't put um, uh, dates on any of his paintings and he also um, uh, named them very similar names so it's it's kind of hard to track exactly when things are done but she's done a splendid job at at at, at a tough job <laughs> um okay here's another wonderful view um the, the tiger lilies um they're very again there's this there's this business of of the 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 japanese print the kind of bringing the bringing the focus of the of the painting right up to the surface and then creating depth by the layers back in into the scene none of it's set up really by 
uh, traditional perspective in this case. It's really by layering that, that we get this kind of intimate sense of being in the landscape. Ah. And here again, um, the garden, a garden path, um, it's square. Again, that, that symmetry, I drew a cross on the thing. So you can see down below on the, on the lower right-hand corner, what that, what that dead center cross does in the composition and how things spin, kind of spin asymmetry, asymmetrically around that center point and around that sense of, of, um, of there's the symmetry of the, of the square, but the asymmetry of the composition. And that, that adds energy to the piece, but also stabilizes it. And here's his wife and one of their children on the, on the, on the left. So he did a number of these really beautiful domestic scenes with the family. Um, very, you know, uh, if you, if you do go to the, um, which I recommend really highly, if you do go to the catalog resume and look at it, you'll, you'll see a lot of these pieces in, in it. Um, ah, okay. And the white bridge is, is again, one of those, I think there's at least a dozen of, of these paintings with the white bridge in it. Um, and they all seem to change and they're done from different points of view. But I heard from um, a lecture by, um, Lisa Peters that that actually he was known to rebuild this bridge almost every year. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe the uh, the um, the brook that got really rapid in the spring blew it away every year, and he had to rebuild it. But I think also he used it as subject matter. So rebuilding it every year. He would he would you know have new subject matter and new new thing to focus on. Um, the interesting thing is the Bridge of Giverney by um, Theodore Robinson, who was one of um, uh, Twachman's close friends, came back to the United States from France and would talk with uh, Twachman, would come out and paint with him in Cos Cobb. Um, um, he was one of the first, Robinson was one of the first Americans to um, go out to Giverny. And, and uh, he had a close friendship with Monet. So, you know, this was the bridge to um, Twachman. <laughs> Basically, uh, Robinson would be telling Twachman what was going on over there with the with the with the landscape. So Twachman continued to develop his garden and his and his um, the house and his subject matter around them while they while the family lived in that house. Um, let's see. Ah, here we go. Um, end of winter this is this is 1889 this was early on and and you see these structures off in the distance um this was from the time of pure inspiration for for Twachman. he was just discovering this landscape and you know exploring the um horse neck brook
point to harmony. Very limited palette, you know. You've got you've got your whites and grays and 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 a little bit of lavender in there and the orange and the green, but but very limited palette and links between those colors. Serene. And I'm actually going to zoom in on this just to show you the texture of this paint. So it's very chalky, very, um, he would probably have wicked out. Wicking means drawing out some of the, the linseed oil out of the paint to get it to be, you know, this kind of dried, um, uh, chalky substance. I want to check my time. Okay. Uh, any of you who are familiar at all with, with Greenwich, Connecticut, Round Hill Road might sound familiar. This was, you know, basically the road near his house and that would be his house around the corner behind that stone wall that's up on the ridge. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in because it's just so lovely to look at the paint quality of these things. So you can see the brushwork. Building up with an impasto. Somebody's asking me a question. Um, yeah, I, I don't exactly know which part of Round Hill Road it is, but um, you can find that out from the Greenwich um, uh, Historical Society. Did Twachman also work in watercolors? He worked mostly with pastel. I don't believe I've seen him um, using watercolor though he, uh, his use of thinned oil paint actually does have the quality of a watercolor. I haven't seen any watercolors though, and there's the catalog resume, you can check it yourself. He did do a lot of etching though, um, I know that. And he used to take plates out with him and, and do little etchings out in nature, you know, the drawing of it and then take it back and, and print it. Ah, spring landscape. Um, so these seasonal pieces, you know, the spring landscape of 1888 would have been before he actually bought his house out there, but but he was, like I said, he was out there exploring. Um, Jay Olden Weir had a house in um, uh, Branchville, Connecticut, which is actually, it's nearby. Um, uh, and so, you know, he and... Twachman went out, I know Twachman and he went out and painted together. Um, quite a different um, uh, location from what it is today. Uh, this Coscob uh, pasture with barns. Uh, <laughs> And again, this this business of the the intimacy of these of these um, uh, garden pieces is something that that is quite wonderful. They're small, some of these. Okay, 
he did go to some spectacular places. He went, he went to, um, um, Yellowstone. He went to Niagara, did go to some of the, you know, spectacular natural places, but for my money, the boats moored on the pond that he had created as a swimming hole for his children and and um, uh, and subject matter for himself on his property from damming up the the uh, horseneck brook um, gives him as much spectacular subject matter as as any of those natural wonders. Um, there's a big difference between Twachman and, and the landscape painters who had come before him that were involved in the, the Hudson River School, who were really interested in, in the grandiosity of, of, of nature, of a kind of um, uh, reflection of, 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 of God's presence in the landscape. That's what they were into, that whole notion of, of, of trying to create this natural, um, this, this adoration of nature as a, as a, um, a spectrum of, of God. These, these pieces are much more humble. They're much more down to earth. They're observed. But I, I have a bit of a problem calling Twachman an impressionist. He was his own man. He was doing something that was quite unique. And, and I find these pieces to have a presence and subtlety and nuance that, that um, often is missing in um, impressionist paintings. There's a presence here. There's, there's an awareness of 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 the fleeting moment and trying to be in it. Um, it's very much that Zen business comes into play in these pieces. Um, sailing in the mist. 1890s is as close as we can get to dating these pieces, but I mean, these kind of hearken a bit for me to Ryder, although although I don't know if if um, there's a there's a mysterious quality to them, and and that's kind of you know these sailboats riding off into the mist. So during the last two years of Talkman's life, um, his, he was separated from his family quite a bit of the time. Um, they, um, his two sons, I believe one of his sons was in the Beaux, Beaux Arts in, in France studying architecture. Um, and his wife and, and the family were, were in Paris. Um, I believe they had run into financial problems and they were renting out the house in Greenwich. So uh, during the last couple of years, he spent time in, in Gloucester. And, you know, from that, from that article that I read you earlier, I, I don't think he was doing all that well. Um, uh, by the same token, they, they are really beautifully painted paintings that he did there. You can see the difference between Frank Devonek and this piece from 1910, uh, the Yellow Pier Shed piece and, and Twachman's open quality to this, to this same scene. Um, more or less from a slightly different point of view, but but still very much the same scene. Um, there's a definite difference in in the in the exploration that's involved with Twachman. And again, here's here's 
Theodore Robinson, um, uh, Talkman's good friend. Um, this was actually painted in, in 1894 and, and Robinson died in 1896. But you can see the difference. Uh, it, um, below on the right is, is Talkman's fish sheds and schooner. Uh, this was painted in Gloucester. He started to reuse the black. There's a, there's a sense of abstraction in these paintings that's developing. And if you look at this, this is the, the bottom two are late Twachmans. Um, and you can see how abstract he's becoming, how, you know, the movement, the rhythm, and the graphic quality of that black that's, that, he's, that he's starting to use again. Above um, is Shed and Schooner, Gloucester. Um, that piece is earlier. And you can see the difference between, between the quality of atmosphere in that piece and, and what's going on with the Gloucester pieces. I'm going to check this. Um, is his house still there? If so, where? Yes, his house is still there. It is, it is owned by a gentleman who has been allowing people to come onto the property um, for this uh, catalog resume and take shots of, of, of the spots where Twachman painted. Um, the house is in, is in good repair. And actually, that was, those images that I showed earlier were from the house. So um, uh, I believe, you know, well, uh, the, the show is coming to, to uh, the Greenwich Historical Society. So you can ask them all the questions that you want about, about the specifics of the house. But it's, private, it's in private hands and being well cared for and loved. In actuality, the house is, has a has a long history and long, interesting creative history. Um, it was in the hands of Jim Henson from the Muppets and his family for a good eight years, I believe, and um, and was sold to the present the the people who own it now. Um, and everyone who's lived in it has has felt a great sense of, of love for the property and, and the care that was put into creating it. Um, so thank you for asking that question. <laughs> um, okay. And here we are coming to the end. My summer studio, this is really one of his late paintings. It's 1900, um, 30 by 30, again, you know, that symmetry, that sense of balance, that sense of meditation, that place of, of you know, there, there's, there's um, directionality and brushwork that's wild and, and going all over the place, but there's also a serenity at the center of it that, that really holds the pieces together. Um, I can't recommend highly enough going to the talkman.org site um and the the um Twachman's road to greenwich is on youtube um good presentation lisa peters is is the one who gives the presentation um there is also another lecture on the property itself and people who have lived in the house uh and the present owner um, so that's another one. It's not, uh, it's not this Twachman's Road to Greenwich, but if you look on YouTube for, you, you know, for the Road to Greenwich, you'll probably see the other YouTube on there. Um, Lisa Peters is going to do another lecture in, um, in, I believe it's September or October when the show opens on the relationship between Twachman and Monet and the development of their properties. I think she's going to do a wonderful lecture on that. I, I, I look forward to hearing it. Um, there is a catalog for this, for this uh, show that's available at the Greenwich Historical Society. Um, and as I said, the show opens October 19th. So in two weeks. Thank you, Larry. Oh, okay. Oh, 
Yeah, you're welcome. In <laughs> two weeks, we're going to be doing um, uh, Rothko. There's going, and the relationship between Twachman and Rothko is not that hard a stretch for me. Uh, so um, there's going to be a big Rothko show. It is not going to happen until 2023. But I wanted to put him in here at this point because of the relationship to Twachman. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Okay, Joan. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. I hope we see you on uh, Carol Birch's program on the 10th at 7 o'clock in person at the library. Okay, thank you all. Bye, Larry. Okay, bye. bye.